I want to welcome everybody to the first Ally Princeton Accessibility Meetup. Um, I'll thank you all sincerely for attending our inaugural meeting this evening. My name is Damien Cyan. I'm the Senior Web Accessibility Advisor in the User Experience Office here at Princeton University. I'm joined by my Associate Director of the User Experience Office, Mary Albert, and uh, Sean Maxim, also of Princeton University and the Provost's Office and some other colleagues we have uh, in our disability service office, uh, Liz Erickson. I'd be remiss to not call that Liz. Uh, so we also uh, have some people here from the, the Educational Testing uh, Services, the accessibility group there. Uh, Mark Hackenden will introduce those folks in more detail uh, soon. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk to you about what the meetup, uh, what the purpose of this meetup is, and what we hope to achieve. So this meetup will be dedicated to topics that help advance the the acumen of accessibility professionals across a, a broad set of backgrounds. Uh, we hope to create valuable material for service providers, for programmers, for project management professionals, and everyone in between. <coughs> So we think about accessibility as a program. There are a lot of hands in that. Uh, and we want to be able to speak to all of you and to provide meaningful content for all of you, which we think is evidenced by our first presentation tonight, which focuses on standards, which applies to every single group within that program. Um, we want to create a some engaging and some actionable content for you. So when you leave here, you can practically apply what you've learned. Um, we want to build a, a, a community of like-minded individuals and professionals that seek to advance the cause of accessibility and provide a more fair and inclusive society for people with disabilities. We're gonna focus on our presentations by industry professionals, hopefully who could provide insight and innovation in the field of accessibility for us. Um, I do want to take some time to talk about the university's mission, uh, specifically b b behind us deciding to partner with the Educational Testing Services for these meetups. The informal motto of Princeton is in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. So, there, there's a line from the, the university's strategic framework, and it says, Princeton University advances learning through scholarship, research, and teaching of unsurpassed quality, with a pervasive commitment to serve the nation and the world. So coming here and providing this platform, we see as a, as a service to create that fair and inclusive and just society. In addition to that strategic objective, another objective of the university is to provide partnerships and collaboration with the community. So another line here uh, from the university handbook is to uh, expand its role as a convener of events that combine audiences from multiple constituencies and groups by facilitating grassroots contacts, contacts and connections. So the Board of Trustees is convinced that the Princeton should encourage the growth of networks and infrastructure that allow it to connect with non-academic partners who can help it carry out its teaching and research mission to enhance its impact on the world. So when the opportunity came to partner with ETS on the project like this, it became very clear that there's an alignment to service and there's an alignment to the strategic objective of creating uh, connections in our community. So we are looking forward to a long and productive uh, set of these meetups. At the end of our presentation, we'll do more of the housekeeping and logistics, and we'll talk about you know, future meetings and, and future topics. We'll also have a survey that will uh, request people's uh, input on, on those things as well. Um, so we're looking forward to bringing some innovative ideas to the forefront, and as we said, advance the cause of creating a fair and inclusive society for people with disabilities. At this point, I'll turn it over to Mark Hackenden of the Educational Testing Service. And do we just 
podium mic, I think, works? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I just want to say about the collaboration aspect of starting a meetup here. I think we both sort of collided on this topic on the Global Accessibility Awareness Day event that happened on two different days for us. Uh, Princeton's preceded ours by a few weeks, but it was the opportunity for us to come to Princeton and see the level of accessibility work taking place here and then for Princeton to come and see what we were doing at ETS. And I'm looking forward to great things at next year's Global Accessibility Awareness Day events, so that's something else to think about. And this group might want to think about this too in future meetups. Um, so I lead the Accessibility Standards and Assistive Technology Group at Educational Testing Service, and our mission is to really address the accessibility challenges that arise from educational assessment. How do we make assessments fair and work for all test takers irrespective of, of disability or ability? So our goal is really something that we call usable accessibility in the sense that you could be conformant with things like the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, but the challenge is, is it going to be usable <coughs> if you're conformant with those guidelines? And so we focus a lot on usability of assistive technologies of content. And so my team consists of researchers, accessibility specialists, accessibility engineers, and project management. It's a group of eight people at this point, and um, we collaborate throughout the organization. Some of our colleagues from other parts of ETS are here um, from the assessment development and alternate format groups on that back row, second to the back row there. And so um, we do a lot of collaboration, we do a lot of consulting, and. Uh, and some research thrown in, too, to take a look at how we can make things better in terms of accessibility. The one thing that we really try to focus on, and that's why we're here tonight to talk and hear from, from Jason White, is that we like to advance the cause of accessibility through standards and following standards. And so we're active as an organization and individually within things like W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, and something called the INS Global Learning Consortium. We're also have had involvement in things like the DAISY Consortium, the DAISY Standards. And so we have a long history individually and as an organization of standards involvement. And so when it comes to W3C, our participation currently focuses on things like accessibility guidelines, which is the new WCAG standard development effort. Uh, accessible Platform Architecture Working Group, uh, the way ARIA Working Group, those of you who are, are hardcore developers here know about ARIA, well, you can help shape where ARIA is going if you participate in standards. Um, the Education Outreach Working Group, which Chris Ann from our team is a member of. And finally, the Research Questions Task, task Force, which our, our speaker tonight uh, chairs at W3C, among as many other standards activities. So, to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Jason White, he's an Associate Research Scientist in the Accessibility Group at ETS. He has been an editor editor of the WCAG standard. He was a co-chair during 2002 to 2004 of the working group for WCAG 2. Um, Jason comes from Australia, as you'll soon recognize <laughs> in his accent. Um, Jason has a Bachelor of Philosophy with honors and a Bachelor of Law with honors from the University of Melbourne. He has a PhD in philosophy from that same university. Um, I first met Jason on a W3C early accessibility mailing list in 1997, I think it was. We encountered and crossed paths electronically back then, little aware that we'd be working together many years later. And so Jason has a long history in the accessibility standards world, um, right from the beginning of the Web Accessibility Initiative uh, at W3C. He's been involved in everything from web standards to ebook standards to SVG, CSS, HTML, and what other acronyms can I come up with at this point? <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago, 2014, I persuaded Jason to leave that lovely land down under and come to uh, ETS in New Jersey, and he was persuaded and came. <laughs> so uh, without further introduction, we'll turn this over to Jason. And what I'm going to be doing is we're having technical difficulties with the display. Yeah. So um, I'm going to be driving the standard, and Jason's going to be talking to, uh, to it. I'll try to minimize myself here. So Jason? And solve the logistics. Yeah, and you want to talk a little bit to uh, uh, the browser. Microphones. Uh, do we want to, can everybody hear Jason? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Web content accessibility 
All right, let's see if we can get into the, the text. So, um, let's see where we are. Right. So we're just solving the technical logistics here as we as we proceed. Um, given the diverse constituency of the audience today, I think it's uh, opportune to begin by uh, outlining the history of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and how we reach the current point. So as Mark indicated, the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Accessibility Initiative was uh, commenced in 1997 and one of the first activities which they undertook late in that year, as I recall, is that uh, the Trace Centre at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which uh, was uh, the, one of the leading research departments in accessibility, having been established by Greg van der Heiden in 1973, if I have my dates right. Uh, anyway, the Trace Centre had developed what they call a unified series of guidelines on web accessibility for web page authors, as they were termed in those days. And uh, they handed over that document, which at the time was the most comprehensive set of guidelines available, to the World Wide Web Consortium to continue development and to uh, transform them into what ultimately became known as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines specification. Uh, the first version of which was completed as a W3C recommendation in 1999 and uh, saw considerable adoption internationally, including uh, substantial influence in policy circles. So, for example, when the US government uh, proceeded to issue regulations under Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which established procurement requirements for the federal government in respect of accessibility in the year 2000, uh, the portions of their regulations which were concerned with web content were substantially influenced by and cited the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 1.0 specification. And uh, obviously it achieved uh, considerable influence in organisational practice and in policy internationally. Although overall, uh, empirical studies have shown that the web continued to develop in ways uh, that largely didn't conform to the guidelines, notwithstanding policy efforts and uh, a significant level of adoption. So uh, in 2000, the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Working Group then proceeded to develop version 2.0 uh, with a number of aims in mind, some of which may be seen as mutually conflicting. Uh, so, for instance, they sought to improve the specificity and the precision of the guidelines so that it would be clearer to web content implementers and to policy developers uh, what needed to be achieved in order to conform. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they wanted to generalise the document to make it more abstract in certain respects in order to accommodate a wider variety of technologies, including changes in technologies, so that the guidelines would be robust in the face of technological uh, transformations that would occur in subsequent years. So uh, it was a long process. I was there for part of it. I had the privilege of working with Wendy Chisholm and Greg van der Heiden uh, to coordinate the effort from around 2000 to 2004. And then I moved on, uh, first of all, resigning as co-chair and then uh, leaving all together in order to pursue a PhD. Uh, because writing a PhD thesis and trying to uh, help lead a, a significant international standards effort were not compatible undertakings. <laughs> um, as, as Greg van der Heiden, having uh, seen many PhD candidates over the years and supervised many, uh, well understood. Uh, but in any event, uh, the standard was issued in 2008. Um, it has been significantly successful, especially in policy, um, in a number of countries. And if you want to find out the details, the uh, Education and Outreach Working Group of the W3C has a web page that will show you the various policy documents 
uh, including regulations and uh, other uh, policy-oriented publications in which uh, WCAG 2.0 has been cited. It's also been used extensively in organisational practice to uh, guide the development of accessible websites and accessible applications. So it's been significantly influential. Uh, but there are and there were recognised to be uh, inadequacies in the document. And in particular, uh, the needs of people with low vision were seen to be inadequately satisfied. Uh, the needs of people with learning and cognitive disabilities have always uh, created challenges in the development of web standards, including, uh, in my view, playing a significant part in the evolution of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines over time. Uh, and those were also seen to be inadequately met, and I think justifiably so. And finally, uh, the emergence and proliferation of mobile devices in uh, the first decade of this century and uh, proceeding into the, the present decade was regarded as giving rise to requirements that were inadequately addressed by the standard. And so the working group established three task forces concerned with the needs of users with low vision, the needs of users with learning and cognitive disabilities, and mobile accessibility respectively, uh, for the purpose of uh, proposing additions to WCAG 2, which would enhance the guidelines in these areas. And so what then became the WCAG 2.1 development effort was uh, begun, formally at least, uh, by a series of proposals for new success criteria uh, which could be included in the guidelines emerging from the three task forces. And so late last year uh, the task forces formally submitted their proposals. Um, during this year the proposals were discussed extensively. Some of them were incorporated into a working draft of what we hope will become WCAG 2.1. Uh, uh, I should point out that the working group has sought to follow a time-based release process which is uh, unprecedented for this kind of effort um, in which they're striving to uh, complete the document as a W3C recommendation uh, by mid next year. And so in that context, in, uh, at the end of August, they formally closed opportunities for adding further proposals to the standard and instead uh, sought to focus on revising the proposals which had already been included in the working draft and developing supporting documentation for them. So uh, what I'm proposing to do in uh, the meetup this evening then is to give a highly opinionated tour <laughs> of uh, the proposals which have found their way into the working draft. Now, um, Jason, I, can yeah. I just ask you a question? How many hours per week do you spend on working group calls and reading working group messages? Well, we have two hours of meeting on Tuesday and an hour, it, it was an hour and a half for a while on Thursday, so that's four to, um, four, uh, three to four and a half already, isn't it? No, three and a half to four and a half. Um, and then we have all the email that goes around and then the surveys to respond to and I don't really want to try to add all that up because I'm really not sure how much that amounts to but I think it's fairly significant. It's a lot of time for Jason and, and uh, he shares the critical issues with members of the team to discuss and hash out. So it's, yeah. it's a, it's a time-consuming process and a big commitment on ETS's part to support this effort. Right, and I should say that if history is uh, serves as a guide, which I suspect it does, uh, there will be very long and difficult meetings before this is concluded. Because as uh, we will see, many of the proposals are controversial for various reasons. So what I'm suggesting that we do then is start to tour the additions to the document. They're all marked as new in the current working draft and so we could start working through them and we begin with probably one of the most controversial provisions in the WCAG 2.1 draft which is entitled uh, 1.3.4 Purpose of Controls. 
Uh, let's see. And you should all have the URL to the current draft. So if you want right. to follow along and look, and if you're highly opinionated too, you can take notes. And share right. Notes with Jason. Yes, you can, you can develop your own views on it as we proceed, right? Try not to be too influenced by mine. So, anyway, in content implemented using markup languages, the conventional name of conventional form fields, conventional links, uh, button, sorry, conventional buttons or controls, or conventional links can be programmatically determined. Now, this has an interesting history, and it's also followed by another uh, success criterion that really extends the concept further. Um, in uh, 1.3.5, I think we'll treat these two together. And this one says, in content implemented using markup languages, uh, contextual information for controls, symbols, and regions can be programmatically determined using a publicly available vocabulary. So those may seem impenetrable to some, but uh, here's the background. So the Learning and Cognitive Disabilities Accessibility Task Force um, has decided that uh, the best strategy for trying to enable the customizations which users uh, who have learning and cognitive disabilities need of web-based user interfaces involves adding uh, metadata or markup into the content which identifies conventional or commonly occurring user interface controls. And they've also determined that there's other information uh, which would be useful uh, to support the needs of those users. That information would then be supported by uh, assistive technologies, let's call them cognitive support related assistive technologies, that don't really exist in widespread use yet uh, but which have been seen in prototypes. And these technologies would then transform the user interface, for instance, by uh, simplifying it or by associating uh, familiar icons or labels with user interface controls or by otherwise making the user interface easier to understand. And so uh, this wouldn't change the primary or default user interface, but it would provide the support that's needed by an assistive technology uh, to carry out these kinds of transformations. Now, uh, this proposal, or this uh, uh, couple of proposals, is somewhat controversial. Uh, in the first place, the technologies required to support them on the user's side are very much at a prototype stage, and we don't have significant research evidence regarding their effectiveness, and in particular their effectiveness across uh, a wide variety of websites and web applications. Uh, furthermore, it is unfortunately the case that the state of cognitive assistive technologies, if we can use the term, uh, at present is not significantly advanced beyond the state at which uh, their development had reached in 2008 when WCAG 2.0 was completed. And so uh, the strategic view by uh, proponents of these proposals is that by getting the proposals into WCAG 2.1 and therefore achieving uh, wider adoption of the proposals, they think they can spur the development of cognitively related uh, assistive technologies that would then enable the users who have learning and cognitive disabilities who really need it uh, to benefit from the uh, additional semantics that would be expressed in the metadata or the markup in accordance with these proposals. Uh, I have to confess that I'm somewhat skeptical of the likely effectiveness of that approach. Uh, and I also think some of the definitions uh, and the lack of clarity associated with these two proposals uh, raises significant difficulties. So uh, I have concerns about these and I also have concerns about relying too heavily on uh, metadata or markup to solve these problems. Uh, we've already seen how uh, the ARIA standard, which Mark referred to earlier, uh, can be misapplied and 
uh, improperly implemented by well-intentioned software developers and I'm, I'm concerned that we'll see uh, even more of this in relation to the present uh, cognitive accessibility uh, proposal. In particular, uh, I'm concerned that uh, the implementations could have, uh, due to their inadequacy, that the implementation could have a very negative effect on the experience of the very users with learning and cognitive disabilities whom the proposals are designed to support. So I have concerns about them. I'm open to be persuaded that the proposals are good ones, but I think there are still interesting questions that we have to talk about and consider as we develop uh, these proposals further. Jason, can I, can I add a comment about something called the CODA personalization uh, standard that is floating around the ARIA working group process? Do you want to comment on that and its relationship to this? Right, so the uh, task force has developed um, initial metadata for supplying the kind of uh, semantics that we described earlier that would help to clarify meaning that would provide alternatives to content that would be difficult un to understand by certain groups of people with learning and cognitive disabilities. And uh, that document is currently under development by a task force uh, of the ARIA working group, which I'm involved in. And they're trying to determine how to clarify it and, and to develop it in such a way that it can be implemented effectively and consistently and taken to a W3C recommendation. So there's very interesting work going on there uh, that raises exactly the kinds of issues that I outlined a moment ago. And are they looking for help? Uh, yes, they are, especially anybody who has expertise in uh, cognitive science, learning and cognitive disabilities, um, or related fields is very strongly encouraged to become involved because uh, this work has global import, it, will, it has the potential greatly to enhance accessibility, and it requires such expertise. And if you're developing large web applications that handle things like registration and interactive forms, you want to understand the potential impact on your web design process and how it might possibly interact with yet to be created assistive technologies. Right. So here we go then, we're moving along, otherwise we won't get anywhere near the end. Zoom, uh, zoom text, content can be zoomed to... We're at uh, 1.4.10. Content can be zoomed to an equivalent width of 320 uh, CSS pixels without loss of content or functionality and without requiring uh, scrolling on more than one axis uh, except for parts of the content which require two-dimensional layout for usage or meaning. Did anybody understand that? <laughs> It used to be a little bit more uh, understandable, but it's been changed to make it. Is this one a replacement of an existing? Or no, this is new. new. So here's briefly the background to this one. Uh, the Low Vision Accessibility Task Force, uh, with some research backing, for instance by researchers such as Wayne Dick, is very much concerned with the uh, requ requirement or the imposition of horizontal scrolling on users who have low vision who need to scroll the screen horizontally in order to read long lines of text and obviously the more they enlarge the text the more scrolling they have to undertake in order to read a document and so uh, this requirement is designed to ensure that the content is wrapped appropriately when it's enlarged so that a user with low vision doesn't have to engage in the scrolling uh, in order to read it. Now the reason why it doesn't simply refer to horizontal scrolling is that we need to write a standard which is fully internationalized and so given the occurrence of left to right scripts and also vertical scripts in East Asian typography and the various mixtures of these, the current wording refers to scrolling on more than one axis as being the problem and presumably if you're using a lot of vertical scripts then it would be the vertical direction that would uh, give rise to concern. So that's why it's written as it is, there have been proposals to rewrite it to try to clarify it and make it easier to understand and those proposals are currently uh, working their way through uh, the discussion process. 
Can I ask a question? How many people here have spent time watching someone with low vision use screen magnification? Okay. You'll know why if you've done that, why this problem has to be addressed in, in the web content accessibility guidelines. It's, it's a significant problem and I'm not sure this is going to explain it well to your average web developer. I have a quick question around this one. So how is this going to impact the success criteria around um, text zoom 200% on a responsive website? Like how are they going to interact with each other? Because this is now, you know, 400% page zoom. So we have to do 400% page zoom but 200% text zoom when we're testing? Um, so, so there's definitely concern about potential interactions between the new success criteria and the existing ones and my understanding is that this introduces a new requirement that is independent of what is already in the document but that uh, there will need to be significant implementation testing to make sure that we don't uh, give rise to undesirable interactions. Does that help to answer it? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so how does this affect mobile, uh, given that you have um, uh, pinching and zooming available on that? Is that sufficient or does it need to go beyond that? Because a lot of times when you pinch and zoom on a regular website, you, it won't um, dynamically readjust itself. So you right. still have to do horizontal scrolling on that. That's right. And so this very much becomes a requirement that would need to be fulfilled in the style sheets to make sure that uh, scrolling is not necessary. Uh, so that's the, the latter point. The former point was with regard to mobile devices and uh, it's recognized that not all mobile environments necessarily enable this, uh, enable the enlargement to take place to the degree necessary uh, for, to support the needs of people with low vision. Uh, but this requirement is written so that it's independent of the platform on which uh, the content is presented and so as long as it can be achieved in accessibility supported ways on some, in some environments then uh, it would be considered to satisfy the requirement. Now that there, there are recognised to be potential interactions with so called responsive design where um, depending on screen size and resolution which would be affected if someone uh, carries out the enlargement uh, some content may disappear or may be presented in different ways uh, for the purpose of optimising it for a mobile device. And I think there are still open issues with regard to the interaction of this requirement where the practice of changing or simplifying the user interface uh, for mobile devices uh, based on the, the very same parameters that would determine uh, layout and presentation in uh, uh, when somebody is carrying out enlargement. So does that does that address the question? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, th I think one thing you'll see as this develops further will be a number of uh, techniques and further definitions mm -hmm. and exceptions. For example, you're not going to reflow and wrap maps, but there are other kinds of content mm -hmm. that can reflow. Some mathematics equations will not benefit from reflow and rewrap and so mm -hmm. um, as these success criteria go through further definition I think we'll see um, a lot of interesting discussion about what can and cannot fall into com conformance with this. Indeed so. Yeah. So now we have uh, several contrast requirements starting with graphics contrast uh, which is concerned with the contrast ratio of uh, for the presentation of graphical objects. And we're at 1411. Yes, we are. He has it all memorized. I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just following along the text here. So, and then there's um, 1412, which is user interface component contrast. Which is a real good one. Yeah, it's a really good one, and that establishes 
a similar requirement with respect to user interface controls. Uh, there is a proposal to merge the two, but that hasn't been decided on yet. Uh, and there have also been interesting issues raised that were discussed in a meeting this morning with regard to the user interface component contrast requirement. So historically, the guidelines made provision for the contrast of text, and these two proposals are clearly, I suppose I'm stating the obvious when I say they're just extending the requirement to encompass user interface controls and significant graphical objects. I think it's a necessary extension, but there are substantial details to be worked out. So we're moving along. Can you give an example of a some of these user interface components that would be essential as opposed to non-essential? So, I, as I recall, it doesn't distinguish between essential and inessential user interface components, but it does in the graphics contrast proposal with respect to uh, graphical objects that are essential uh, to understand the meaning of the content. And that's currently a slightly controversial point. Uh, some people have suggested, and I'm one of them, that they should draw a clearer distinction between essential and inessential graphical objects by making use of the existing language inherited from WCAG 2 with respect to uh, content that is purely decorative. And so you could say that anything that's not purely decorative could be subject to the contrast requirement. Now, there are those who claim that that would include too much, in which case the question is, can they, uh, can they define what ought to be included in the requirement in a way that doesn't leave it as wide open to interpretation as words such as essential or required for usage or meaning do? Is there a way of being more precise about it? And I think that's the open question at the moment. Does that, uh, does that answer it? Yes. Any other questions? So adapting text, we're on 1.4.13 on my copy here. Okay. Yes, this one is a good one. Uh, all right, so if the technology is being used to allow the user agent to adapt the style properties of text, then no loss of essential content or functionality occurs by adapting all of the following and then it refers to line height, uh, spacing underneath paragraphs, letter spacing, and word spacing. So again, this is an attempt to support uh, paragraph and character level adjustments that need to be made in order to improve visual readability for users with low vision. And uh, this proposal um, also initially sought to include uh, font family, uh, but uh, they ran into difficulties in uh, setting out uh, a testing procedure that would determine whether uh, such a success criterion could be reliably evaluated. That is to say, would it be possible to uh, determine reliably whether web content met that requirement and so far they haven't found uh, acceptable means of doing so uh, in attempting to extend it. So the properties listed there are the ones that we have and as I said it's a readability requirement uh, in essence. And I just want to add also that one would think that this is really targeted toward individuals with low vision who want to be able to adjust typography, but there's research suggested that a lot of these kinds of adjustments in terms of word, character, and letter spacing is very helpful for those with reading disabilities. Right, so, and in addition, there are some font families that are known to be, uh, or some fonts that are known to be more readable by certain people with learning disabilities as well and currently that isn't addressed. So, but there's interesting research on the topic. So we're, we're still working our way through 1.4.14 content on hover or focus. Um, let's get to the text of it. When a user interface component which receives keyboard focus or pointer hover 
causes content to become visible, the following are true. Um, and there are various requirements set out here, uh, which I, I won't read out for the sake of brevity. But basically what they're trying to achieve here is to prevent content which is triggered on, as, I, as it says, on hover or focus from obscuring uh, either the triggering control or other associated content. And so again, this is uh, an issue that's particularly relevant to users with low vision. And uh, there are currently interesting challenges associated with this proposal. Um, and there have been issues raised about it. So we move on. We're 2.2.6, accessible authentication. This is an interesting one. And there's actually a, a, a clear inconsistency in the text of this that's currently being addressed. Um, and I should point out that it uses the word essential here and currently the use of the word essential throughout all of the new proposals is under detailed discussion with a view to uh, ensuring that it's only used where it's being applied in accordance with the definition that we have of essential in WCAG 2.0. So a lot of this text will be rewritten and some serious issues uh, will be uncovered as we attempt to tighten up the usage of the term essential here. Essential steps of an authentication process which rely upon recalling or transcribing information have one of the following um, alternative essential steps which do not rely upon recalling or transcribing information and an authentication credentials reset process which does not re rely upon recalling or transcribing information. You want to think about the implications of that for any kind of web sign-on process right. where there's a password requirement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, again, this is going to be very interesting from the perspective of how can you implement it. Right. And when, when are there going to be instances where you have other requirements that mandate those exact things, too? That's well, right. Too. I thought you said 1.3.4 is going to be the most controversial. <laughs> <laughs> you think this one is? Yes, I, I do too. So first of all, here's my question. Here's my essential question on this one. Uh, now the Web Authentication Working Group of the W3C is working on an API that will allow devices associated with web browsers, whether it be a separate hardware device or a device that is available to the operating system to perform the authentication function. And currently we're looking at what the accessibility requirements are in connection with that specification. And that work promises to make it possible for users to authenticate much more securely than they have been able to do in the past without relying on traditional usernames and passwords. So one of the strategic questions is how well developed uh, this work will be by the time WCAG 2.1 is supposed to proceed to recommendation. Uh, but the more interesting question is, uh, what are the security implications of this proposal? And so at the moment, it refers to both recalling and transcribing information, and it appears from recent discussions that those who put forward this proposal uh, were seeking to restrict both recall and transcription. So, for example, a two-factor authentication scheme that depends on the user's ability to copy a security code from another device would then become problematic with respect to this proposal. And so that would restrict very significantly the range of uh, highly secure authentication schemes that are available. And my particular concern, uh, it relates to the likely effects on vulnerable populations. And my suspicion is that uh, users with learning and cognitive disabilities, at least some subset of those users, uh, is likely to fall within uh, vulnerable populations who would uh, find it much more difficult than, uh, let's say, the average web uh, user uh, to address the consequences of having their credentials and their personal information uh, acquired by malicious entities. So, 
Uh, the, the concern is that on the one hand we need to remove the accessibility barrier for people with learning and cognitive disabilities of, for instance, password-based schemes. And it seems we have, uh, we're on the way to standardising solutions to that. But on the other hand, we want to make sure that we don't uh, create security risks that could be uh, of devastating effect on exactly some of the populations that the uh, success criterion is intended to benefit. Question, do, you, do you see that like uh, things like the touch ID on the iPhone and face recognition are a good way of uh, bypassing some of these challenges? Um, yes, I do, but we should also recall the accessibility implications of biometrics. So uh, at the moment, the, there's uh, provisions in the European Union's uh, procurement standard and similar provisions in the new version of the US Section 508 standards, uh, which are of course regulations under US law, which provide that uh, information technology systems cannot rely on a single biological characteristic when um, biometrics are used for authentication. Mm -hmm. And obviously the motivation for that is to ensure that people who don't have the biological characteristic in question are not disadvantaged and we seek to solve that problem by relying on uh, alternative, a multiplicity of alternative biological characteristics, preferably unrelated characteristics. So for instance, fingerprints and palm prints wouldn't be a good pair of alternatives for somebody who doesn't have hands. So uh, there are challenges there, but I think that it's also, as you suggested in the question, a, a route forward. So uh, let's see, do we arrive at 2.2.7, uh, interruptions. This is essentially trying to strengthen provisions that we already had uh, about users being interrupted or distracted by uh, changes in content. A mechanism is easily available to postpone and suppress interruptions and changes in content uh, unless they are initiated by the user or involve an emergency. So I think the cognitive <coughs> basis of this should be fairly obvious, that some people uh, are very easily distracted by changes that, uh, that many users would not be distracted by and that the reasons for the distractibility are entirely due to uh, cognitive disability, and so this is an attempt to strengthen the requirements here. Uh, then we get timeouts. Uh, and this is, it says, where data can be lost due to user inactivity, users are warned at the start of a process about the length of inactivity that generates the timeout unless the data is preserved for a minimum of 24 hours of user inactivity. So uh, again, this is strengthening the provisions with respect to timeout. Um, now, it's, it's somewhat controversial because some people have argued that warning the user at the start of a process that they're going to be subject to a timeout isn't really going to solve their accessibility problem. It may enable them to uh, take mitigating measures to reduce the severity of the problem, uh, but it isn't actually going to solve it. And so there's concern about whether this success criterion uh, achieves the level of benefit that would warrant its inclusion in the standard. But at the same time, you have uh, people in the Learning and Cognitive uh, Disabilities Accessibility Task Force arguing that uh, they would benefit significantly from having such uh, notification in place. Okay, so we're moving along. Uh, and the next one looks like 2.2.9, uh, animation from interactions. So, uh, uh, for non-essential animations triggered by a user action, there is a mechanism to disable the animations, yet still perform the action. All right, so uh, this again uh, relates to questions of distraction. 
and um, I don't think at the moment it's significantly controversial. Any questions about those th that set before we move on? I guess I'll come and say that last one, especially it tends to be true because um, for my work with people with autism, I just gave someone a prototype and said, hey, is there anything you want me to add? It's really basic. And he's like, no, it's great. Just keep it like this. You don't need any, uh, the, the fact that the background is white is great because it's not distracting. So definitely the last one is true, I think. Exactly right. On then for 2.7 interruptions, so does that mean that like this would be the end of all of that? <laughs> we can only hope. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Uh, Two point four point one one. A character key shortcuts. Okay, two point four point eleven. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is controversial, and I have to admit to being the source of some of the controversy on this one. If a keyboard shortcut consisting entirely of one or more character keys is implemented by the content, then a mechanism is available to turn it off or to remap it to a shortcut that uses at least one non-character key. Some of the controversy around this was aired in today's meeting where there are concerns about the implications for controls that uh, provide single key shortcuts that become available when focus is given to the control. So uh, they're talking about an exception to this. I think the wider problem with it, which is why it's controversial, is that the rationale for it has not been well articulated. So the initial rationale was supposed to be that speech recognition systems uh, that had both command modes and dictation modes would often um, insert text inappropriately when focus was not on an editable text field. So if focus was not on an editable field but um, the application implemented single key shortcuts then the user could inadvertently invoke commands by uh, speaking to their text recognition system, either deliberately or inadvertently. Now the problem with that is that uh, participants from Microsoft uh, determined that they could only reproduce that problem with one vendor's text recognition system, and so it seems to be a fairly weak rationale uh, to require everyone to conform to this uh, success criterion for the purpose of working around one text recognition system's uh, difficulties and it's more broadly been argued, especially by me, uh, that that particular kind of problem really ought to be solved by the text recognition uh, developers uh, in their user interface and not imposed on web application authors. Now, some people have suggested that there are other forms of justification for people with uh, disabilities of this particular requirement. I must <coughs> confess that I haven't understood them very well in the meetings in which they've been discussed. Currently, rationales for all of the proposals are being written, so when that comes out, we'll have a look at it and see if we're any more persuaded by the alleged necessity of this requirement. Oh yes, and there are people who say that it's easy to implement and so it should just be added just, just on that basis, which I also think is a fairly weak reason to uh, add a requirement to a fairly complex international standard. <coughs> but there we go, we'll see if the revised rationale turns out to be persuasive. All right, let's move along. So the next one is 2.4.12, label in name. So uh, for active user interface components with labels that include text, the name includes the text of the label. So that means the name that it would be communicated to an accessibility API and the purpose of this is to ensure that assistive technologies, and in particular here, speech recognition systems, 
are provided with the text of the visible label that they can then recognise uh, when the user utters it in a command. So that's the obvious rationale for this. Uh, there may be other usability related rationales for screen reader users, but I think the text recognition case, uh, speech recognition is the primary motivation here. Uh, and in that case it comes from the Mobile Accessibility Task Force. There's been some editing done on this. Um, I don't think it's overly controversial at the moment. But that can explode at any time. And we look at the next one. Uh, let's see where we are. And the pointers. Pointer accessibility. Sorry, I made, I made a mistake here. You're, you're close to the pointer. That's it. Here it is. Uh, so it's 2.5 pointer accessible. It has a series of new success criteria underneath that. Um, so 2.5, sorry about this, I made a mistake and got to the wrong heading. My error. 2.5.1, pointer gestures. And this one, this one reads, all functionality can be operated with a single untimed pointer gesture unless a multi-point or time gesture is essential. Now the purpose of this is to assist people with physical disabilities who have difficulty carrying out multi-point or time gestures in a user interface, particularly in touch-based mobile devices. And so we can see its origins then as lying in the mobile accessibility work. And uh, at the moment there is some concern about the kinds of gestures that this would preclude and uh, whether those should be um, restricted in order to solve the underlying problem here. And so, yes, there's still some ongoing working group discussion of this one. 2.5.2, .2, accidental activation. Right. For single pointer activation, at least one of the following is true. Activation is on the up event, either explicitly or implicitly. Uh, a mechanism is available, favorite term in WCAG, uh, that allows the user to choose the up event. Uh, uh, confirmation is provided. Um, Activation is reversible or down event activation is essential. And I'm just summarizing the text here of each of these. So it's a similar issue to the last one. It's concerned with people who have dexterity limitations uh, and for whom it is much more effective if the activation of the control occurs on when it's released rather than when it's uh, pressed. Uh, any questions about this one? So, you have to have one of those bullet points. Yes. Okay. You don't have to have multiple of them. Okay. That's right. Yeah. And um, currently, there are proposals afoot to try to clarify that text. And. I guess arguably when you say activation is reversible, let's say you tap on a link you didn't mean to tap to, you just tap the back button to go back. Does that count as the activation being reversible? Uh, that's a good interpretive question and I would say yes. I don't know whether everyone would agree, but it seems to me that that's, the user agent is providing the mechanism for reversing it and therefore that would seem to me to be a reasonable assumption to qualify as being reversible. Mm -hmm. That's what an undo function if that were available. Right. Concurrent input mechanisms. So this one is concerned about uh, content that seeks to uh, restrict the input methods that can be used uh, in order to interact with it. 
so the underlying concern here was with uh, user interfaces that can be operated, for instance, by keyboard input or by pointer or touch input. And the concern was with regard to uh, preventing the use of one input modality when the user has already started using another. So in other words, supporting the user in being able to switch input methods during an interaction is seen as significantly valuable uh, for people with disabilities and I would expect uh, uh, physical disabilities to be of particular concern here, uh, possibly cognitive to some extent. Um, I'd be interesting to see exactly how they explain it when the rationale comes out. I don't think it's significantly controversial at the moment uh, because in most cases applications don't provide for the kind of restriction which this success criterion is intended to prevent. And we're on to a level AA uh, success criterion of 2.5.4 target size. So the size of the target for pointer inputs is at least 44 by 44 CSS pixels um, except when uh, when the uh, exceptions apply and there's a list they're listed here so again uh, physical disabilities of various kinds people who find it difficult or impossible to move a pointer onto a small target especially if they're using uh, touch input those are the those constitute the issue which this proposal seeks to address and it does so by imposing limits on um, uh, lower limits on acceptable target sizes the concern with it is that there are so many exceptions and qualifications that one might doubt whether the intended beneficiaries are going to gain very much by its implementation now they seek to address that by introducing a level AAA requirement in 2.5.5 which is target size no exception that tries to alleviate that criticism somewhat uh, but we should still think carefully about just how effective the uh, higher priority level AA requirement is likely to be especially where there are a lot of small links and uh, small controls of the, the very kind uh, that would give such users the greatest difficulty. I have a quick question on um, yeah. 254. Um, so it says under the exception for inline that the target is a block of text. Like, do you think, I, I have a feeling like some developers are gonna get confused when you're referring to like, like that's meant to be like display inline, right? Not display block. Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. I think that might confuse developers. You can file a comment to the working group. <laughs> okay. You yeah. can go to GitHub and write it out and send it into the public comment. <laughs> Any of us could, but I'm just making that as a general invitation to the audience here that uh, this is open for public comment at all times. And uh, this is the live document, so this is the most current version, and you'll see there's a link that says raise new issues. And so that will take you to the commenting process so that you can file comments against this. And they will be dealt with. And later in the process, they have to be dealt with formally, which means that the working group has to develop a written response. Additional sensory. OK, let's see. 2.6.1. 2.6.1. Device sensors. Uh, here's another controversial proposal, and I'm one of the uh, agitators of the controversy again. And I agitate him when I read it, so. <laughs> uh, all functionality of the content can be operated without requiring specific device sensor information unless the device sensor is essential for the function and not using it would invalidate the activity. Very familiar WCAG language in use there. And so I think the purpose is clear to 
uh, restrict the use of device sensors that are not normally designed as means of user input uh, in, in uh, application to user interfaces. Now, uh, the challenge here is that some of us argue, and I'm one of them, uh, that the existing WCAG 2.0 requirement of 2.2.1, uh, sorry, 2.1.1, uh, which requires all functionality to be operable via a keyboard or a keyboard interface, has that very implication built into it. And so that it's impossible to satisfy the keyboard requirement without simultaneously satisfying this requirement. Now, from that point of view, what's most important about this proposal then is not so much the requirement as the exception, because currently WCAG has no exception to allow device sensors to be used as a means of user input, for example, where that uh, input mechanism is, is essential to uh, the activity and would invalidate it if not applied. So uh, what some of us have suggested is that it really ought to be crafted as an exception to the existing uh, requirement inherited from WCAG 2.0, uh, or at least it should be significantly clarified to make it obvious that the exception is the important point here. All right, so 2.6.2, orientation. And uh, yeah, this one is this one has undergone significant detailed discussion this week. Content is not locked to a specific display orientation and functionality of the content is operable in all display orientations except where display orientation uh, is essential for use of the content. So here uh, it's an issue from the Mobile Accessibility Task Force and they're concerned with the uh, accessibility of user interfaces to people with physical disabilities who may not be able to rotate their device or otherwise change the display orientation. And so the concern is where content that is fixed to a given display orientation and can't be uh, reoriented, as it were. Now, one of the challenges with this proposal is concerned with the word locked. Uh, and that arises in particular in the fact that it's a term of art used in the uh, display orientation API of the W3C. Uh, one can very easily write uh, an implementation of a button which allows the user to lock and unlock the display orientation within the web application. And currently there's no provision or exception provided to allow that and it therefore seems to preclude uh, use of that particular API entirely, even in cases where uh, being able to lock and unlock the, uh, the orientation would be useful functionality. So at the moment, there's detailed discussion of exactly how it should be rewritten, and uh, those conversations are ongoing. Now we've jumped through quite a bit before we get to a new addition to WCAG 2.1. That's right. We're moving significantly here. 3.2.6, change of content. Let's remind ourselves, not least of all me, of what this one is about. So I can read, programmatic notification is provided for each change of content that indicates that user action was taken or that conveys information unless one or more of the following is true. Uh, there is a programmatic determined relationship between the new content and the control that it triggers. Uh, or the user has been advised of the change of content before or as a result of using the content and or the control and the change of content both is not a result of user action and is not related to the primary purpose of the page. Um, right. Perhaps advertising. Very good. So this is, the purpose of this proposal is to fill up a perceived lacuna in WCAG 2.0 where it provided for assistive technologies to become informed of the roles and state of controls, uh, but it didn't provide for uh, notification of changes uh, to the user interface, especially for controls that are not currently the subject of focus. 
And so the objective here is to fill that gap uh, by requiring notifications to be provided with respect to certain changes. Now, there have been issues raised in relation to this requirement which were subject to a survey this week. And in particular, uh, it's been asked whether forms that introduce uh, new questions or delete existing questions based on a person's answers as they carry out the process of completing the form should be required to conform to this uh, success criterion by providing notification of the changes to assistive technologies because the argument is that such changes should be uh, expected by the users and therefore if they're using a screen reader for example they should uh, they can be expected to discover the changes in the course of reading and navigating the content as they complete the form. Now I have to say I'm not entirely convinced by that line of argument uh, and it will be interesting to see where that discussion develops in uh, subsequent weeks. So, so like in this process of um, going through, you know, to LinkTag 2.1, are you guys expecting there to be changes then in certain techniques? Because I think there's a technique that says um, that as long as there's dynamic content changing after a trigger, that that is kind of uh, considered like a good technique. Is, um, is that going to change because of this new success criteria, like that kind of technique? Um, so uh, the development of techniques for version 2.1 is very much uh, a second priority to completing the specification itself, but nevertheless there are people working toward that objective and my understanding is that the working group intends to have the techniques entirely written uh, in, in preparation for the candidate recommendation phase. So the answer is that yes, and any implications for existing techniques, which is the precise point that you're referring to, uh, would need to be addressed in revising the techniques documents uh, in order to incorporate appropriate solutions to meet the new success criteria. Well, thank you. And I think that's the end of the additions. Uh, I, let's see. I think that might be. Let's see if we have any more. Hold on. No. Conveniently, if yeah, you're looking at the WCAG specification, the draft, you'll see that all the new additions to WCAG have very bold <coughs> marking. You'll see the green border. You'll see all the notes about the editors are reviewing this and so on. So uh, if you're going through it, it's pretty easy to find it. Um, so, so that's it. And so I suppose it's up to the concluding remarks. So, uh, I mean, obviously there are definitions in here that we didn't discuss for lack of time. Uh, many of the challenges lie in the details of the definitions as well as in the detailed text of each of the proposals. I hope that this overview has uh, given you a deeper understanding of the motivations for the proposals, the direction which the working group is taking, and some of the issues uh, that are raised by uh, what is now in the, the draft. So I think uh, there are deep-lying challenges here, especially in efforts to improve accessibility for people with learning and cognitive disabilities, uh, which are going to be once again difficult to address. And uh, I don't have time to discuss the entire history of how cognitive disability has shaped the evolution of WCAG, but I think you'll find that it's played a very significant role, and rightly so, and it continues to do so now. Um, there are also questions about whether the time-oriented release process will enable a high-quality specification to emerge. Uh, we can be assured of many detailed and difficult meetings and an abundance of ongoing controversies as the working group uh, strives to meet its schedule and also to uh, resolve all of the outstanding issues. Uh, not only those which have already been raised, but those that will be raised in the future. And once more, as Mark indicated earlier, uh, those in the audience are strongly encouraged to review the draft carefully and thoughtfully and then to uh, transmit 
your comments to the working group so that they can be taken into account in a very interesting and challenging process that we hope will uh, constitute another important step in uh, making the web more accessible to people with disabilities. There are other issues we could talk about. Uh, if there are any follow-up sessions, we'll see what we can do there. And you're also, I assume that you're welcome to uh, communicate to the event organisers with regard to issues that you would like to see addressed in future presentations by appropriate speakers. And so I'm sure we'll delve into the details uh, in coming months. So thank you for the opportunity to present today and uh, I appreciate the thoughtful questions that were raised in relation to the proposals. Were there any general questions for Jason before we do our housekeeping back in the back? Uh, I'm an accessibility novice, so excuse me if I don't use the right lexicon. <laughs> um, early on you made mention of I guess the hardware component of this, having not advanced since 2008, maybe I'm wrong by the year. So it seems to me these new features, if you will, also mean it will require that to be updated. Is that, do you, you know what I'm saying? Like there's two parts of this. So even with all these new specifications, if they can't be accessed and used, there's still that bridge to be crossed, yes? All right, so uh, let, let's take it in two parts. Just put it up any way you want. Right. <laughs> well, well, that's fine. Let's do it this way. I think I asked the question. <laughs> so I think, I think there are two separate strands here. So on the one hand, what I was referring to as not having significantly changed since 2008 was the range and availability of assistive technologies designed to improve the accessibility of the web to people with learning and cognitive disabilities. And that's largely a matter on the software side rather than on the hardware side, and it's also an area in which significant research is required. Uh, my argument would be that instead of trying to uh, introduce requirements into the WCAG specification uh, based on li a limited understanding of what will solve the problem, that it would be better to undertake further research in respect of uh, cognitively supportive assistive technologies and then to use that line of evidence as a basis for influencing the standards in a way that is uh, empirically well supported and which can therefore be morally uh, well justified. Uh, they're taking a different approach which uh, I think has its difficulties. They may turn out to be right uh, but I'm raising questions about it. Now the second side of it, which is in relation to hardware, uh, lies in the um, accessible authentication success criterion where it will very much depend on the availability of new hardware, including biometrics, uh, to be able to provide secure authentication without relying on the user's ability to recall or transcribe information. And so in that respect, I think we need the hardware developments that are certainly ensuing to uh, be accompanied by appropriate web standards. And we're seeing that uh, evolution in the uh, web authentication API that's currently being standardized by the W3C. Uh, but I think widespread implementation will take a while and uh, we have to decide how the, those implications, the security implications and the implementation schedule uh, align with the development of WCAG 2.1 in that requirement. Does that uh, answer the question? Sure. <laughs> There's some precedent for that too, right? Like, um, didn't they take a while to roll out audio descriptions in Canada with the AOD because of some technology constraints? So yes, the, the actual widespread implementation can take quite a while. I think the concern that some people have, and I'm among those people, uh, in relation to the cognitive assistive technologies is that at the moment, the kind that would take advantage of the proposed uh, metadata are very much at a prototype stage and we haven't even seen how effectively they apply across a variety of web applications and also how 
uh, efficacious they are in meeting the needs of users within the intended populations. And so uh, let's draw a close analogy with the uh, requirements in uh, success criteria in 4.1.2 regarding the role and state uh, information that needs to be made available uh, to assistive technologies, especially to support screen readers. Now, in 2008, the ARIA standard, which supports that particular requirement in practice, was very well on its way to development. They had implementations in web browsers. Uh, they were building on uh, approaches to screen reader accessibility that had already been well established in the desktop realm. And what we're seeking to do in relation to cognitive assistive technologies is really to devise a new class of assistive technology to solve some very difficult problems of how to make web content more understandable to people who have specific uh, cognitive uh, limitations. And so uh, we don't have that wealth of experience to draw on as we did in the screen reader case uh, to craft the requirements on the basis of evidence and so the concern would then be that the cognitive support is in a much early, earlier stage of evolution um, than the screen reader support for the dynamic web content was in 2008 and so we can't really claim that introducing these requirements into WCAG 2.1 would be comparable to introducing that requirement of 4.1.2 into WCAG 2.0. I, I will just add there are a lot of great research opportunities to explore this, both in trying to look at existing web applications and how you would reflow or simplify it on the fly for someone with cognitive learning disabilities. So, I mean, it, it's a really open, rich area for people to do some innovative work. And I should just very briefly say that I made, I put my argument there as well as I can express it. Uh, I did outline the counter argument earlier, so I hope that charges of unfairness won't be forthcoming in that regard. <laughs> okay, I think. Yeah, I think we're, we're at our time. time. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of just housekeeping items with you guys before we conclude. Um, we'll be sending out a Survey Monkey evaluation at the end of the night tonight. Um, the schedule that we're proposing at the moment is to do every third Thursday here on campus. Um, except for December, because that'd be kind of silly to do the third Thursday of December. So November, January, February have been booked for this room, and we hope to continue uh, that. Um, in order to do that, as Jason alluded to earlier, we are looking for proposals for our presentations. Um, and we'll make these resources, uh, actually they already are available in the, the, the meetup, the links for the deck, the, the website Jason used tonight, and um, your, the rack card you have there will all be available on the, on the website. So with that, we'll conclude for the evening. Um, the room will be open for a bit if you want to stay and chat and do the other parts of the, the meetup. <laughs> but this does formally conclude the presentation. Thank you for attending. <laughs>